Hello from the studio in Nitro, West Virginia. This is Unreasonable Doubt. It's a podcast about West Virginia University basketball. I'm Josh Witt. West Virginia finished out their non-conference schedule tonight in Cleveland playing Ohio State, and uh, it ends in a loss. Again, West Virginia loses 78-75. They take it to overtime. They had chances tonight to beat Ohio State in Cleveland, and it went to overtime, and Ohio State scored 11 points in their first five possessions of overtime. That's a pretty good clip. That's more than two points of possession. And you end up losing by three. Before I talk any about the game, wasn't it great to get a, a mic'd up ref? I mean, it was just, you saw what happened in overtime. And you saw what happened at the end of the game. But we got a mic'd up ref. I think the, even the broadcast ended with the referees wishing everybody Happy New Year. Okay. Like, it's a... You know, take swings, Fox. We even got refs in the locker room. Mic'd up the ref locker room. (laughs) And you know they don't want to talk into a microphone. I mean, I guess they signed up for it. The one guy did. And he seemed pretty level-headed. I just don't, I just don't want that. I just don't want that. It's not something, you know, what would be neat to watch as part of my basketball experience. Let's let's hear from the refs more. I want to hear from the refs when they're explaining what kind of nonsense, or if it's correct, what call they're making after like a, a seven-minute review. Like I do want to hear their voices on what they come up with when they stop the game to get everything sorted out. And then really outside of that, I don't want to hear from them. Maybe you like that part. Maybe it was like, you know what? These guys are human beings, which they are. And, you know, it makes them more relatable, which it it probably does. I just did not, (laughs) I did not care for that. I've got a, I've got a sense of what's going on with the refereeing without needing them mic'd up. But about this game, Pat Sumnick, you, you didn't listen to the Radford episode, I was slanderous to you, Pat Sumnick, and you shoved it in my face tonight. It was clutch Pat Sumnick in the game, at the end of the game, and Pat Sumnick, Patrick Sumnick, he scored seven of West Virginia's last 10 points of the game in regulation, including, you remember the Radford game, I may have said, of all the people on the court that could have had the ball, I would prefer, like, number five on my list would have been Pat Sumnick. And yet, tonight, West Virginia put me in the same position where West Virginia down two. I feel like that was the proposition against Radford. Sumnick is part of the pick and roll. Sumnick gets the ball, and this time he finishes. And I deserve that. I actually called it in the in the Discord, the Smoking Musket Discord. If you're not there, you should check it out and be a part of the conversation there. Good group of, of chatters. I actually, I don't know what I was doing. I was just like, yeah, Pat's got the hot hand. Feed Pat. And they did, and he delivered. I'm an idiot. He, you know, I, that will end my Pat Sumnick slander for the year. Because Pat Sumnick gets his team to overtime. I mean, just being strong with the ball. He had an and one, and he just took his time on this one where he did not take his time with the Radford shot, and he made it, and it was great to see. I'll, I'll egg on my face all day. I don't know what I'm talking about. Established. Raekwon's really good at basketball, the 29 point. <laughs> the 29 points per game streak is over, but he he is efficient. Sometimes it seems like he's forcing it, and especially in overtime, he was forcing it, but the ball ends up going through the basket. Like he he just keeps coming. Like if the if the shot doesn't fall, 
he's right there to put it back in. He did that a couple of times in overtime, and he's really good at basketball. Noah Farrakhan, it's it's a good and a bad with Noah Farrakhan. And he had a lot of good tonight. Also, you know, there was some bad. <laughs> so there's a mix with that guy. The the good really stood out tonight, and you couldn't you couldn't get him off the floor. JoJo Harris made some key plays. It's just it's just West Virginia coming. It's just West Virginia spending most of the time behind. They don't quit. They don't give in. They just can't get over the hump. And this is Josh Eilert's 13th game as a head coach. And we've seen it in a few games, especially in late game situations, where Eilert is getting outcoached, right? Of course. It's he's he's got 13 games under his belt. And I've said on this podcast, and you watch. Uh, Josh Scheidler, he's a man of very few emotions. And when Raekwon Battle looks like he gets fouled on a three late in that game, right in front of Coach Scheidler, he gets a technical foul. And is that the best time to do that? And West Virginia was down five. Hindsight, it doesn't kill you because Ohio State misses the free throws and West Virginia gets the ball back without Ohio State scoring the basketball. So hindsight. That's a win for Coach Eilert. But in the moment, down five and you get a tech, he makes those free throws and Ohio State has the ball, then you're saying a different thing. And so it's just a the time that he picks to be vocal, it's in an overtime game of a game that's not out of hand yet. His predecessor, you think of that Kansas game where West Virginia only shot two free throws and it was getting out of hand late. And and it was out of it was getting out of hand. That's the key part. Huggins loses his mind, gets ejected, and and everybody remembers that and and respects that. But it it didn't cost West Virginia the game. the The game in that situation was already out of hand, and Huggins has had enough. Eiler does this, you know. Hindsight twenty twenty, he would he would he would take that back. I mean, maybe he wouldn't. Maybe no matter when that happens in the game, when that happens and he sees it, he he gets a technical foul. But not the best spot. And then last possession for West Virginia, you get the rebound off of a missed free throw. You're down three, but there's not. It doesn't look like there's a plan in place. Curse dribbling at the at the after half court. There's no timeouts left, and it gives them Ohio State enough time to foul up three Kerr misses the front end of the bonus Ohio State dribbles out the clock and that's a good Ohio State team just like Virginia's a good team and West Virginia has yes they have bad losses on their resume but they've hung with good teams too in different iterations and every starter scored the night which is great a cook got in there late in the second half Right before I was saying, like, please, how many times, you know, I'm a I'm a Seattle Supersonics fan. And back when the Supersonics were really good, you'd have four guys who could score the ball, and then you'd have a center that may or may not score the ball. It whether it was the other Urban Johnson, whether it was Jim McElvain, there's probably another one that I could think of where, yeah. That guy is, he's the fifth guy. Sam Perkins comes off the bench. This guy's going to play. He's in there for defense. The other guys are going to score. It didn't bother me as much. It is It is kind of weird that you have a starter that doesn't score. But it was the same one every time. And yet this year for WVU, it feels like each game, a different guy who's a starter has chosen not to score. I don't like that feeling. It didn't happen tonight. Uh, and. I'm kind of skipping around here. Coach Eiler, let me give him credit. This team is not good at defense. And Eiler is masking that with that zone. West Virginia digs themselves a hole, goes to the zone. It works out, keeps them in the game. They were down 14. They ended up being down two at the half and stayed in this game because of that zone. So he's masking it. It's not like he's 
it's he's all the way, you know, it's not like every time you're watching a WBU game, you're like, the coaching is off. He's doing good things. And I don't know if this is a redeeming quality. It is true that Coach Eiler, his first press conference, his first time he's taking questions back in the offseason, he said, I'm concerned about rebounding. And brothers and sisters, he wasn't kidding. He had that marked. Now, how do you fix? Then it's up to you as a coach to fix that or to try to mask that. And he hasn't figured that out yet. But he he pinpointed the issue immediately, not knowing who is going to play, not knowing that Kerr is going to be out and all the crazy stuff that's happened. Did you see that montage when Fox is explaining to the national audience What's been going on with WVU? It's it's just like a portion of the crazy. It just starts with Huggins resigning. That that went. <laughs> you could have added more <laughs> to that montage, but that was a long montage of like, this is why they're five and seven. Look at this. It was. I mean, it's and so with all of that, he's he's not doing bad, right? And they and West Virginia tonight in that zone, then it's like, oh no, rebounding's gonna be bad. It wasn't terrible. It's was actually pretty decent rebounding out of the zone in the second half. Just some key rebounds late in overtime uh, that you that are just backbreakers. And listen, the, West Virginia they they had a three zero lead, and then they never let again. And you go to overtime. But you, it's, you know, it's it's West Virginia down eight, and you're working from there, and you can get it tied, and you can get it close, but just getting over the hump. West Virginia has not been able to do that with all the different teams that they've put out there. It's been different teams. This this group of guys have played three games together. They're one and two, including a win. And where they got into the 90s against Toledo. I don't know when West Virginia, if they if they get to 90 again this season. But they did. And Battle has come out of the gates hot. And Farrakhan is really good. There's some bad there. And all that to say, West Virginia has sufficiently dug the hole that they cannot get out of in relation to postseason. Because what's coming up next is an 18-game Big 12 schedule that is absolutely, regardless of if you think they got a good shake as far as who they're playing twice versus who they're playing one time, how those are broke down, the order of the games, these next 18 games as a whole are going to be way harder than the first 13 games that they played. And it wasn't the, it, it was a pretty decent, schedule as far as who they played uh so and that monmouth loss wow but it only gets crazier from here so as established after the radford game it's just it's just ruining somebody else's night you're gonna be an underdog most likely maybe west virginia i mean maybe west virginia will be a favorite in the home game against UCF. Outside of that, I think they're going to be betting underdogs barring injuries for the other team and and West Virginia stays healthy. That's what they're facing is being betting underdogs in 17 of their last 18 games and possibly 18 of 18. That's what it, what's ahead of them, but also they can hang with good teams. They hung with St. John's. They hung with Virginia. They hung with Ohio State tonight. Those are all good teams, possibly tournament teams, all three of those teams. So to figure out how West Virginia has fared with their conference schedule, we we lean on Ken Pomeroy's computer. And by we, I mean me and you're listening to me. And what do you want? Do you want the good news or the bad news first? The bad, let's start with the bad. The bad news is that according to Ken Pomeroy's computer, West Virginia 
I mean, you don't even need a computer for this. West Virginia is the is probably going to be the only team with a losing record going into the conference schedule. West Virginia has the worst Ken Pomeroy rating of 14 teams in the Big 12. They have the worst offensive rating in the Big 12, and they have the worst defensive rating in the Big 12. So there's 14 teams, last in winning percentage, last in overall rating, last in offense, last in defense. Will they end that way? We'll find out. You get Jesse Edwards back, hopefully no other injuries, and then you've got a full roster to ruin people's days. You know, you're going to ruin a day or two. I think that's possible. But that's that's not that's not even saying anything about the schedule. It's just what the computer says about WVU going into the schedule. Also bad news, you start the Big 12 schedule with an undefeated best in the computer Houston team and you get them on the road. So of all the ways to start your schedule, I mean, technically, you only play Houston once, so it is like ripping the Band-Aid off and getting it out of the way. But the immediate bad news is you get the best team first, and you don't get them in Morgantown, and West Virginia has not won a game outside of the Coliseum so far this season. So that's, that's the bad news. The good news is they can have a way worse Big 12 schedule. When you look at the computer, the Top four teams in the computer in the Big 12, Houston, BYU, Kansas, Iowa State, you only played those four teams one time. You don't play those teams home and home. So that's a, that, that could be worse. You could play all those teams twice. You don't. You, as I mentioned, Houston going to Houston for the first game of the conference schedule. You get BYU. You know, let's say it all together. Number four in the Ken Pomeroy rating, BYU Cougars. You get them in Morgantown. You get the Kansas game in Morgantown, so no trip to Allen Fieldhouse. And you go to Hilton against Iowa State. So that's technically good news. You only play those four teams once. And the the teams you play twice, the, the only two in the top half of the conference is Baylor, Jalen Bridges, Baylor Bears, and the Texas Longhorns. And they're seventh. Texas Longhorns, 32nd overall out of 360-some teams in Division I, according to Ken Pomeroy's computer. That's good enough for sixth in this conference. Excuse me, seventh in this conference. (laughs) That's that's what you're dealing with. Back to the bad news part. The seventh best team in the conference is the 32nd best team in the country, according to one computer. And that's the deal. Like the 13th best team in the conference, Oklahoma State, is the 94th best team in the country in that computer. That's so that's, you know, these first 13 games where West Virginia is five and eight, way easier schedule than whatever concoction you have of playing in the Big 12 this season. So anyway, you play. So that's the good news. So that means four of the bottom half Big 12 teams, you play twice. You play home and away. You play TCU home and away, Cincy home and away, K-State home and away, UCF home and away. So you're And you're probably going to be underdogs. In those games, like the computer, that's another bad news. Is the computer says West Virginia is projected to be an underdog in all 16 Big 12 games. I would argue they might be a favorite with Jesse Edwards back when you get UCF at home. And then every other game, probably going to be an underdog. So not great, but it could be where it could be. Worse, and you <clears throat> so you start with away at Houston, and then from there, the most home games you get in a row is two, the most you go away is two. And 
really you beginning with the last day of January and going through the rest of the schedule, it's basically two games at home, two games on the road, come back home for two, hit the road for two until finishing the season in Cincinnati. So it's the schedule's more difficult. You would argue that the team's going to get better if they stay healthy and will get even better when Jesse Edwards comes back and the coaches each game, Coach Eiler and the coaching staff, get more experience and will be better. They will always have less experience than every other team they face this season. Every team that they play from a coaching perspective, <clears throat> assistants and the head coach have coached more games than who West Virginia is going to bring, even when they get those reps. So that's going to be a disadvantage all year long. So that's how the schedule breaks down. Uh, and again, the goal now is to just catch catch teams off guard. Because if, let's say, hey, Josh, here's the optimist viewpoint. Hey. We, we took Ohio State to overtime in Ohio. Raekwon Battle has been awesome. Noah Farrakhan has been great. Everybody's figuring out their roles. You get Jesse back. Let's make a run in the Big 12 Conference. To do that, you've got to go, again, against a schedule where you're most likely a betting underdog to sniff the NCAA tournament without winning the tournament in Kansas City, the Big 12 tournament, you got to go 13 and 5 against 13 teams that are in the top 100, the top third of the country and the hardest conference in America. You got to go 13 and 5. And teams WVU's been in that air, they had way better teams and more experience in the coaching staff. 13 and 5 is uh I'll say it if I if I'd love to be wrong. 13 and 5 in this conference with this team and this coaching staff is impossible. And I think you've got when you go into the Big 12 schedule 5 and 8, you got to go 13 and 5 to have a chance of getting an invitation. And then you still got to do pretty good in Kansas City. So that's, when you say it out loud, that seems crazy talk. Unreasonable Doubt is under the Smoking Musket umbrella. There's another podcast that's under the Smoking Musket umbrella. It's called West by Pod. It's a WVU football podcast. Did you see Neil Brown get doused in mayo did you see west virginia beat north carolina to get the nine wins in their football season all the vibes are high and jordan and joel i'm sure will reflect that in their upcoming episode to break down the mayo bowl and the season as a whole so definitely check them out wherever you listen to podcast go to the discord go to smokingmusket.com Read all the good stuff. Check it all out. Smoking Musket. But we'll start the Big 12 schedule a week from today, Saturday, January 6, 2024. You go to the Fertitta Center to play the undefeated number one in the country, Houston Cougars. And that is going to be a problem. <laughs> as good as you feel about, oh yeah, I like this team, it's coming together. Here's what, guess what? Houston, you know what they're really good at? You know what they live and breathe? Defense and offensive rebounding. Like they just live for that. That's what Kelvin Sampson and his Houston Cougars, and it doesn't matter who's on the roster, a Kelvin Sampson team, they just, that's, they wake up and they eat offensive rebounds and they breathe defense and it's, and they smother teams. They beat Rice 75 to 39. 
They beat Penn tonight 81 to 42. Their first game of the season, they won 84 to 31. And it doesn't matter who they play. That's what they can do. And they can do that to good teams too. And so are they gifted offensively? No, but they don't have to be because, again, what they have for breakfast is offensive rebounding. They're fourth in the country in that metric in the Kim Pomeroy computer. They're the number one defensive team in the country. And it's like, it's elite. They're the best against, they're the best two point defense. They're the best. They have the highest percentage of block shots, they have the highest percentage of steals, they have the highest turnover percentage as a defense. They hold teams to the lowest effective field goal percentage. Like, it's not like top 10, top, like the best. The best in the non-conference schedule at that. And then the stuff that they're okay at defensively, it's all top 10. They hold teams at 27% from three. Somehow they hold teams to 61% from the free throw line. You, You can't defend free throws. And yet teams that play Houston are not good at shooting free throws. Now, Houston is not a good free throw shooting team. It's the it's the only thing that I can find that's that's rough. And they foul a lot, but they foul a lot because again, they breed defense. They're super aggressive. So that's going to be a problem for this West Virginia team. They are getting better offensively, but that's at Houston going to be a problem. That game is Saturday, January 6th, 2 p.m. It'll be streaming, so you won't have to witness this nationally. You got to find this game. I'll be there. You'll be there. We'll watch it. We'll hope for the best. They may be. They possibly could be close to a 20-point underdog in a conference game against a, a new Big 12 team. Houston wasn't in the Big 12 last year. You know how in football is like, ooh, <laughs> Hey, guys, welcome to the big league. Uh, Houston doesn't have that vibe. Houston's been to a Final Four recently. They're really good at basketball. So it's, it is going to, I think they are going to have their bumps in the road in the Big 12. It's not going to be a bump against West Virginia. Or will it? That's it for this episode of Unreasonable Doubt. Listen on all the platforms. Listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't record the Toledo episode. Christmas, man. It got me. Just could not get to the microphone. It was a busy Christmas season. I hope you had a good Christmas or holiday season. I did. The podcast suffered for that. You don't need to, you don't care about that. You might not even, who's listening to this anyway? <laughs> but if you are, listen on Apple, listen on Google, listen on Spotify, listen on Amazon, YouTube. Until next time, I'm Josh Witt, WVU. For the 2023-2024 season, they have five wins and they have eight losses.